We are recording this session, so um, th those who cannot join us can review this later. Uh, my name is Evan Rutter. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Alumni and Parent Engagement at Claremont McKenna College. It's a pleasure to have all of you here. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, I hope you, your family uh, are safe, they're doing well. Um, the college is, is thrilled to be able to provide programming to keep our community engaged and connected. Hopefully you learn, you have fun, you see some friends um from years past and you make new ones as well through all of our virtual uh, engagement opportunities uh quick update about the college we are of course um uh, we have released all the students as of spring break they went home they finished the last eight weeks virtually uh and now they are uh on summer recess until we return in the fall the college is doing everything we possibly can to return students uh, in the fall uh, starting in, in late August, um, and we'll be uh, working with, to make sure that happens over the coming weeks and months. We thank you all for your thoughts, your support, your philanthropy, your offers of jobs and internships, and just overall your uh, your goodwill and your good feelings over the over the last few months as we all weather this incredible storm. Um, today, I'm thrilled to, to introduce an alumnus of the college. Uh, these programs have highlighted alumni, faculty, staff, uh, and students. Uh, and today, we have Michael Shear, class of 1990. Uh, he's a White House correspondent uh, for the New York Times, the New York Times Washington Bureau. He's a veteran political correspondent. Uh, before joining the Times in 2010, he spent 18 years writing about local, state, and national politics at the Washington Post. He was also part of the Pulitzer Prize winning team that covered the Virginia Tech shootings in 2007. He is a 1990 graduate of Claremont McKenna College with a degree in government and journalism. We can talk about that later. Uh, Michael, it's a thrill to have you here. The floor is yours. Great, thank you. Um, hi, everybody. This is uh, amazing. I, I uh, appreciate you all coming, uh, turning out to listen and to talk, and I hope we can have a really interesting conversation. I'm going to try to save as much time as I can, at, at, you know, for questions because I, because I think these things are more fun when it's not just me rambling on. But I'll, I'll try to do a little bit of talking first. Um, I want to thank Jenna and Evan and everybody at the at the uh, alumni office for having me, for inviting me. Um, I, I think these things are important when we, we all can't do them in person. So at least let's, let's figure out how to do this um, remotely. I am coming to you from my little office in my house in Annandale, Virginia, which I practically haven't left since March uh, 11th, I guess, which was the last time that we went back into our bureau. Um, and like most of you, I guess, have been sort of stuck uh, since then. Um, um, so let me just, I, I guess I'll start by just giving you a little bit better sense of sort of what I've done in the 30, uh, I got an email just the other day reminding me that it's been 30 years since I graduated from Claremont McKenna, so thanks for that. Um, <clears throat> but uh, in those 30 years, I, I took a, a brief detour to the Kennedy School to get a graduate degree and then have basically spent the rest of the time uh, writing about politics at sort of every level. I started in local politics at the Washington Post. Um, you know, covering city councils, school boards, that kind of thing, covered state politics for six or seven years, uh, and then shifted to national politics, starting with the 2008 presidential campaign, which I spent two years trailing uh, John McCain and, and uh, Fred Thompson and, and Rudy Giuliani and the other Republicans in that campaign before shifting, before uh, coming onto the White House beat at the beginning of 2009 when, when Barack Obama became president. And since then, have basically covered the White House ever since. Uh, eight years of, of President Obama traveling uh, around the world with him and covering the sort of high and low points of that administration. And then, um, and then the last three and a half years, a very different um, experience covering President Trump, obviously, uh, a very different president and a very different presidency. Um, so, um, you know, what I thought I would do, I, I'd really love to invite at the end any questions about any of that. We can talk about politics, we can talk about uh, the upcoming election, we can talk about the sort of protests and riots that are going on today, if you want to talk about current events. Um, I'm sort of open to whatever you guys want to hear about. Um, what I thought that I would do, though, before that, and, the, and I talked to Evan and Jenna about sort of a, a, a sort of thematic talk, that, that marries up or ties several of the biggest stories that I've covered over the, over the last three years of the Trump presidency and sort of ties them all together or, or a thread that runs through all of them. Um, and so, um, uh, so in that thread that I wanted to talk about is the idea of the president, of President Trump's um, um, 
feeling and belief that there is a kind of deep state, uh, bureaucratic deep state that's allied against him, uh, that is uh, intent on seeing his presidency come to an end, that, is, that was from the beginning, um, um, you know, uh, convinced that they were uh, out to get him, out to try to impeach him uh, from, the, from the first. Um, and that, that belief really shapes a lot of what happens at this White House. Um, it is what it is uh, certainly by no means the only thing that that you know drives his decision making. But I think um, as I sort of reflect over the last three and a half years, it's one of those things that really sort of uh, animates his the decision making both for him and the people around him. Uh, so so I thought the first one I would talk about is immigration. Uh, and, and the president's immigration policies. This one's dear and near to my heart. I covered immigration policy all through the, the Obama presidency, as well as, uh, as uh, then continuing on through the Trump presidency. Uh, it obviously was one of the big things that uh, was the centerpiece of his presidential campaign. It was uh, arguably the thing that won him the White House, um, or one of the, uh, you know, if, if, if my argument was, was always that trade and immigration were sort of the two um, twin issues that really powered his, uh, his candidacy. Um, and I ended up writing a book about it, so it, it's always fresh on my mind. Um, I think that, um, you know, one of the, 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 the clearest way, or one of the themes that comes, uh, comes through when you start looking at how the president uh, and Stephen Miller, who is his chief kind of architect of his immigration agenda, one of the one of the um, biggest frustrations that the president and Stephen Miller had throughout the last three and a half years was this belief that uh, bureaucrats at the State Department, in the Department of Homeland Security, at um, Customs and Border Protection um, were actively working to thwart his agenda. So when the president was trying to put in place asylum uh, changes, uh, when, the, when uh, Miller was trying to uh, uh, build the wall, uh, push the bureaucracy to design uh, a different kind of structure, a different kind of wall, um, that, that oftentimes the, uh, the bureauc bureaucracy would push back, would say, this is not the kind of thing that we're, that, that we're sort of set up to do. Um, the, the, um, the president uh, and uh, Miller, would argue that uh, that the bureaucracy was slow walking his proposals. And in fact, what you saw in the first year and a half especially was that a lot of the proposals that the president made on the immigration front were in fact uh, stymied, slowed. For example, uh, Stephen Miller spent two and a half years pushing a policy called the public charge, which uh, uh, which was a rule that ultimately ended up being a 400 plus page um, regulatory change, uh, which requires essentially, um, uh, which allows the government to to deny green cards to um, uh, to immigrants who do not have a lot of wealth, who can't prove that they won't become a burden, a financial burden on society. Um, one of the reasons that Stephen Miller thinks that it took two and a half years to push that regulation through was because they viewed. Uh, people inside the decision making inside deep inside the agency as as fighting against them as slow walking his proposals as 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 regularly um, raising legal objections that they became frustrated with and as you can imagine President Trump has no sort of patience for that kind of legal niceties that would uh, that would constantly be um, uh, constantly be brought forward. Um, I thought one of the ways to sort of highlight this in each of these sections that I'll talk about is to talk about an individual person. And one of the people that, um, uh, that uh, we write about in, uh, in our book, in my book, is a fellow by the name of Larry Bartlett. Larry was the head of uh, a, a department in the state, a part of the State Department called Population Refugee Migration. And so he was one of the top officials at the State Department who dealt with trying to bring refugees into the United States and resettle them. These are refugees around the world, uh, you know, people who are fleeing war and poverty and violence and that kind of thing. 
Um, that had always been kind of a hallmark of the United States foreign policy. The, under the Obama administration, uh, they had uh, significantly ramped up the number of refugees that the United States brings in every year. Um, Larry Bartlett had been part of that, had, been, had worked under the Bush administration, under the Obama administration, and again, uh, as a civil servant under the, over the, uh, under the Trump administration. Um, but when he and Stephen Miller sort of found each other in uh, the Situation Room on several occasions, uh, Bartlett really didn't back down. He was one of the few public bureaucrats who stood up to Miller. Um, one, uh, one example was when uh, Stephen Miller had ordered a study on, on the economic cost of refugees to the United States. And the study came back and it actually said, well, in fact, the, the, you know, ref, the average, on average, refugees are actually a benefit to the United States. Well, Stephen Miller didn't like that at all. Um, and Larry Bartlett and he got into a big fight about it. And um, what happened uh, is, uh, uh, you know, that while, while uh, Miller lost a couple of rounds and didn't, didn't immediately get the kind of changes in the refugee program that he wanted, um, ultimately, you know, the administration and President Trump controls who works where. And so I thought I'd read um, a, a, just a little section from my book. Uh, this is the book, Border Wars, um, that, that sort of shows you what happened to poor Larry Bartlett. Uh, Bartlett was abruptly removed from the Bureau of Population, Refugees and Migration at the State Department and assigned to a job in the office that handles Freedom of Information Act requests sitting next to low-level civil servants entering keywords into a computer. He went to Puerto Rico for several weeks to assist in the federal response to Hurricane Maria and later took a temporary assignment to Ankara, Ankara Turkey with the Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs. Uh, at his farewell party at Tonic, a pub near the State Department, filled with wooden tables and adorned with e exposed brick, colleagues and refugee advocates wept not just because they were sorry to see Bartlett go, but because his departure seemed to say so much about the dangers of standing up for refugees in an administration determined to shun them. And so, sorry, my notes are on the ground. So, you know, I think that, that Bartlett is an example of how the administration began by colliding, Trump and his people began by colliding with these bureaucrats who were sort of pushing back against his policies, uh, but ultimately found ways to push them aside. Um, the, next, the next sort of large topic is, uh, is impeachment. And, and after um, writing my book with my colleague, Julie Davis, who had at the time been a White House correspondent as well, we, the two of us both moved on to writing about the impeachment process. Um, Julie became our congressional editor and then I became the, one of the lead reporters covering the impeachment in the House and then the, the Senate trial. And one of the things that Julie and I talked about after this crazy four month, five month period was the extent to which a lot of the, the, those same themes about the deep state carried through in impeachment as well. So, you know, you saw the same kind of anger and rage and frustration on the part of the president and his, the people around him at the same kind of, of bureaucrats who they saw pushing back against, in this case, his Ukraine policy. So you had all of these um, you know, State Department and, uh, uh, um, and officials one at a time coming out and testifying before the, uh, before the House committees. And, and in the same way that the, uh, the uh, uh, immigration employees were doing, they were sort of trying to enact administration policy, but pushing back where they felt like the administration had, had stepped over a line or the president stepped over a line. One example that, I, that Julie and I talk about a lot is Alexander Vindman. This is the colonel who was the Ukrainian American um, who was put in charge of, of Ukraine policy, the top Ukraine expert at the, state, at the uh, National Security Council. Um, and he, he was like Larry, uh, you know, outraged by what he saw as the, you know, president pushing beyond the sort of norms that a president would normally push. In this case, uh, you know, pushing to, to uh, uh, have the, the Ukrainians investigate his political rival. Uh, and Trump, 
in the same way that they saw the immigration advocates as obstructing his agenda, Trump thought that uh, Vindman was, uh, you know, was part of that deep state. One of the tweets, one of the many tweets that the president um, offered up about uh, Alexander Vindman, uh, he called him very insubordinate, um, said that he uh, had reported the contents of my perfect call incorrectly. Uh, but in the end, the, the, the result was the same, right? So Alexander Vindman was, uh, uh, along with several other key witnesses against the president, purged uh, from the government. The president, in Vindman's case, fired him uh, less than 48 hours after the president was acquitted in the Senate in early February. Um, uh, and, you know, sort of in the end, it was the same pattern of suspicion by the president, confrontation uh, over uh, policy, and then ultimately uh, consequences that, that uh, followed. Um, this is what I, I wrote in the Times um, the day that he was fired. Emboldened by his victory and determined to strike back, Mr. Trump ordered Gordon D. Sondland, the founder of a hotel chain who donated a million dollars to the president's committee, recalled from his post, and on the same day that Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman, a decorated Iraq War veteran on the National Security Council staff, was marched out of the White House by security guards. The, ouster of Mr., the ousters of Mr. Sondland and Colonel Vindman, along with Mr. Vindman's brother, an army officer who also worked on the National Security Council staff, may only presage a broader effort to even accounts with the president's perceived enemies. In the two days since his acquittal in the Senate, Mr. Trump has railed about those who stood against him, calling them evil, corrupt, and crooked, while his press secretary declared that those who hurt the president should pay for it. So, so that, you know, uh, that struck uh, us as the, a kind of continuation of the same theme. And then, you know, that shortly after the, I mean, that was early February, shortly a couple weeks after that all ended, we, we all plunged headfirst into the coronavirus coverage. Um, obviously, you know, we all remember that. Um, the, uh, the, I wouldn't have necessarily expected, but, but the same theme, theme persists. Um, you know, I have been struck by how consistent the president's frustrations are, this time aimed not at diplomats or at, uh, you know, bureaucrats who are dealing with immigration policy, but rather uh, with scientists, with the medical community and the public health experts uh, that are around him. Um, all of that has been on display, um, you know, in some ways in, on public display as the president, uh, you know, sort of publicly dismissed the early warnings. You had him out, uh, you know, talking about how there were only 15 cases and soon there were going to be zero cases. Uh, you had uh, privately the president clashing with uh, the people uh, on his coronavirus task force over recommendations that they initially gave on, um, on uh, moving to a more a broader mitigation against the virus. He didn't want to do that. He fought with the, uh, with the scientists um, and obviously fighting again with the scientists on the question of how quickly to reopen the country. Um, you know, one of the things I do a lot is to talk about uh, all of this with uh, with people around the president, with the senior uh, White House officials, and it has been amazing to me how frequently in those conversations they, both with reporters like me, but also with each other, uh, they openly refer to the uh, officials at the Centers for Disease Control (CDC) as the deep state. I mean, they they don't even try to hide it in a sense. They they openly describe. Um, the CDC scientists as members of the deep state and they uh, and their frustration uh, I think is uh, that they again view these uh, public health officials as trying to embarrass the president there have been in instances where um, uh, you know the, the the White House and the task force have uh, uh, tried to recommend uh, or have, have have overruled something that the CDC uh, some kind of guidance that the CDC had, had wanted to put out. Um, and instead of that being the last word, the CDC or somebody has leaked to the press that generates a, a embarrassing headline and, the, and, and sort of adds to the sense inside the White House that there's this kind of cabal, um, you know, allied against him. Uh, an example of that happened just the other day 
where the uh, CDC had recommended and posted on its website uh, a recommendation that if churches reopen, they should consider not uh, using their choirs because those, uh, uh, those could be uh, uh, an instance of spreading the virus more aggressively than, than they, you would like. Uh, the White House was upset by that. They didn't know that that was going to be a recommendation. The president had already been sort of urging people to go back to church. Um, and so within a few days, the, the original guidance that had been posted by the CDC on the website is replaced with another set of guidance that says nothing about choirs. Um, and, you know, that is just one small example of the, um, you know, repeated clashes between the White House and especially the CDC, although it's, it's sort of broader than that as well. Um, you know, one, we're still in the middle of the coronavirus story, so I don't have another example that's quite like um, Larry Bartlett and, and, and Alexander Vindman, although there was an interesting story early on. Um, in, in late February, the president had flown off to India for a couple of days to, to do a visit to uh, a sort of a state visit to India. Uh, it was right before the, the coronavirus really shut everything down. Um, while the president was there, a top CDC official by the name of Dr. Nancy Messonnier, who had been the head of infectious uh, respiratory diseases at the CDC, uh, held one of her regular daily briefings that she had been ho holding with reporters uh, just about every day um, at noon. But she went further that day, this is February 25th, I believe, she went further that day than she had in the past in really urging or really uh, warning that the country was facing something that was going to be really big. I mean, remember at the end of February, we were all still kind of uncertain how bad this virus was going to get. Um, she said on, uh, she said at the time, the disruption to everyday life might be severe. She said schools might have to close, conferences would be, could be canceled, businesses might have to make employees work from home. And she said that she had told her own children uh, to prepare for, quote, significant disruption to our lives. Well, that had the effect that you might imagine that that would have at that time. The stock market crashed a thousand points. The, uh, you know, cable news ran headlines, you know, for, um, for, you know, hours throughout the course of that day. Top CDC official says, you know, this could be terrible. Um, of course, it was exactly at odds with the sort of happy talk that the president was saying at the time about how this was all going to be fine and the virus was going to go away by, uh, by early April. Miraculously, it was going to just disappear. Um, at the very moment that she was describing that to reporters, the president was walking up the steps to Air Force One in India to fly home. It took him 18 hours to get home. And in that time, by, by the time he lands, all hell's broken loose at home. He goes crazy, um, you know, very angry, uh, calls HHS Secretary Alex Azar, um, you know, you're scaring the shit out of people, he tells Azar. Um, and, and, and essentially, you know, sends a, a very clear message of what he thought should happen. And what happened? Nancy Messonnier hasn't been heard from since. Um, you know, technically, she's still an employee at, at CDC. Uh, she hasn't given a single briefing since then. Um, you know, the, the, that next day was when the president put Mike Pence in charge of the task force. Uh, you know, there, was, there were several days in which the vice president led those briefings. And then, of course, the president uh, himself led them from from then on, um, and uh, and Messonnier has been has been gone. And again, it's um, it's uh, you know she hasn't been fired, but I but I think that it's you know part and parcel of the same um, you know kind of animating suspicion. Um, and I think that you know when history looks back on this period and this presidency, I think that one of the one of the um, uh, you know, I think that it will find that the president's suspicion, his anger, his paranoia um, about the deep state, what he calls the deep state, about the, the sort of bureaucracy that he feels was allied against him. Um, I think that I think history is going to find that that was a significant factor in how he made decisions and what decisions he made. 
Um, it meant that he rejected out of hand the, you know, much of the collective wisdom of the government. It's something that, um, you know, most presidents, um, uh, you know, have some have some issues on the margins. I mean, clearly, there, there's that's not he's not the first uh, president to ever chafe against a recommendation that a bureaucrat would have given him. But most presidents recognize that the sort of professional, um, uh, you know, the professional employees at whatever agency you're talking about are there, have been there through through multiple presidencies, and are uh, an asset and a and a and a and a kind of a trove of experience that. They don't want to um, ignore. Um, he pretty much ignored them. It also meant that that had the effect of shrinking the uh, decision making, um, you know, to to an ever smaller and smaller group of people uh, around him, none of whom, uh, you know, are, are necessarily experts in the fields that. Um, you know, that, that the president has to make a decision about. So whether that's immigration policy, whether that's, um, you know, foreign policy related to Ukraine or other European nations, whether that's um, science, whether that's, uh, um, you know, the, uh, uh, the climate accords. I mean, it, 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 it had the effect over time of rejecting the kind of that, that built up uh, expertise that had that you know in every government is there the the political layer that most presidents install upon the government are um, you know are always there but there's there's you know there's a usually a kind of uh, collected wisdom that has built up over the years if not decades and and the, this president largely ignores them um, so I guess I I don't know how long that is. Yeah, I guess that's a good place to stop. I, I would say, you know, in, in just one final thing in anticipating a question, like I almost always get the question, so is there a deep state that's allied to get, you know, a, a raid against this president? And, um, you know, I, I got us, I'll anticipate that just by saying, you know, the, I've, I've interviewed hundreds now of, of employees of this government since Trump came in. Um, there are no doubt, I am certain, some people who work for the government who are opposed to his presidency and would like his presidency to end and no doubt are probably doing their best to make that happen. But the, the, the really striking thing for me has been that most of the people, almost without exception, uh, that I have interviewed for, you know, whether it was for the book, whether it was for the many stories I've written on all of these topics, um, you know, they all and whether they, you know, almost all of them worked for multiple administrations for, for presidents from both parties, they all get that, you know, the new president comes in and takes the country in a different direction. And almost to a person, they've all said, we sit down these long interviews over dinner, uh, they all look at me and they say, of course, he was going to take the country in a different direction. He, he's a different president than, than a different party than, than Obama. I, I think what they, they all describe, you know, being, being understanding the need to shift direction, but all of them describe this frustration and this, um, and this sort of quandary when, when they saw uh, the president and some of his aides pushing beyond uh, what they thought were either legal boundaries, ethical boundaries, or, or frankly, boundaries of practicality, right? Um, when when the president would would uh, you know uh, talk to Kirsten Nielsen, the head of the Homeland Security Department, and say, you know, I want to build a moat across the entire southern you know part of the United States and fill it with alligators, uh, you know, it took her a while, multiple conversations, to push back against him and say, sir, that's just not possible. Like it's just not possible. Um, and so whether it was the impracticality of ideas like that, or whether it was the legal um, implications of some of the things that, that he wanted to do, um, or the ethical implications, there were, you know, there, the, I think that's uh, where most of this comes from. And, um, you know, it, it, I guess from his perspective, that's the deep state. I think, you know, from another perspective, uh, it is, uh, you know, bureaucrats, uh, uh, you know, members of the government uh, trying to protect uh, and keep, keep the, uh, um, you know, keep policy not 
in one political camp or another, but keep policy within the bounds of propriety. So anyway, that's, that's, um, that's one thought of, of uh, sort of how to look at, at some of the big, big moments of this presidency, but I'm open to talking about, to fielding questions about that or anything else. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, so we've had a number of questions emailed and submitted in the chat, both privately and publicly. We also have uh, someone who's already raised their hand. So if you do have a question, feel free to put it in the chat or raise your hand, which is what our dot has done. Uh, if you raise your hand, then I'll actually unmute you and call and you can, you can ask it directly. Uh, first question comes from uh, Jay Tremblay in Chicago. Um, how has your workday changed during the lockdown? Once you go back to the Bureau, how will your workday change again? Um, so I don't know for sure the answer to the latter question. We, we've been told by our, the folks at the Times that we won't go back before Labor Day at, at the earliest. Um, I suspect that as is the case with a lot of folks, um, if, if and when we do go back, that there will, it will be some sort of staggered kind of approach where, I mean, you know, our office is, it looks like an accounting office. I mean, it's nothing special. It's, it's, a, it's a couple blocks from the White House, but it's basically just a bunch of cubicles that we all sit in. And, you know, I, I think the, the, the hard part is that like, like so many other jobs, a lot of the dynamic, uh, a lot of the best stuff comes from just being together in a room and having sort of um, spontaneous conversations about about what you're doing. I mean, normally the the five five of our of the six White House reporters sit in a little like our cubicles are all next to each other in a little pod. And so under normal circumstances, we all are constantly, you know, we have a big monitor in the on the wall with CNN and Fox and the other networks on all the time. You know, and so and we're constantly, you know, standing up and talking to each other about, you know, the coverage, about what you know, whatever just happened, whatever crazy thing just happened that moment. And I think the, and, and we're constantly running back and forth to the editors who are in a kind of another part, the other side of the office. And so I think there's, there's something lost sitting here in, you know, it, we're all trying to, we, we have a standing Zoom call every day at 1015 where the five of us and, and our editor get together six of us and our editor get together. Um, but I think there's, and, and we're, so we're trying to do it that way, but I think, I think there's something lost, frankly, and I hope that we can get back to a place where we, um, you know, we can get back to the office. And then of course, for, on the coverage of the White House side, you know, we ha I haven't been back to the White House in two and a half months and we're do doing all of this, almost all of this, you know, remotely watching the briefings. Um, not, I mean, obviously the president hasn't been traveling much um, we did, we have started traveling with him again. So when he went down to um, the Space Center the last couple of times, one of my colleagues, uh, Peter Baker, was on that flight. Um, and so we're, you know, uh, but, but, you know, a, a, a big part of the, the job is being there, is being, you know, watching the president, being with him w wherever he goes, uh, being at the briefings, talking to the, to the White House officials in person. And I, I think, I, I hope that we can get back to that. Thank you. Uh, next question comes from Steve Warner. Steve Warner is asking about the Republican leadership and, and the, they're standing up to Trump. Uh, and he's asking kind of where are the Republican leaders right now? What should their role be? Why are they not standing up when appropriate? You know, that's an interesting question. I mean, there was a, um, uh, there was a tweet that, uh, that I retweeted um, yesterday by a fellow by the name of uh, Brendan Buck, who was the chief advisor to Paul Ryan when Paul Ryan was the House Speaker. Um, before that, Brendan worked for uh, John Boehner, who was also the Republican House Speaker before that. Um, and Brendan uh, is now in private practice, and he, uh, he expressed uh, just outrage at what had happened last night um, with, uh, with the president uh, uh, you know, cl with clearing out the protesters and then the president going on that photo op in front of the church. Um, and I think there were a lot of questions, uh, you know, on Twitter in response to his sort of statement of outrage, like, okay, that's fine, but where were you and where was your boss uh, and your other, you know, your, where was the Republican leadership um, who, you know, at the time when they were in office? Um, and, you know, I, I think that's a, I think that's a really good and fair question to put to Republican politicians who are in office, um, who 
frequently, all the time, are uh, um, telling reporters and others on background that they are frustrated by what the president says, by the way the president says it, um, but they are not willing to say that publicly. I, I talked to a very, very senior Republican aide to a very senior Republican senator, um, several, I mean, it was at the beginning of impeachment, um, who was absolutely, um, you know, sort of outraged with what President Trump had done, but his boss was not at all um, saying that publicly, even though he says his boss thought that as well. And I, and I think that, um, you know, the answer to why that is has a lot to do with the sort of uh, political power that Trump, that, they, that the Republicans believe Trump exerts um, over, their actual, over the people in their party. Um, and they believe, and I've talked to many of them who say, I could come out tomorrow and say something negative about the president or challenge the president on a tweet or, uh, you, know, uh, you know, chide the president for his language. Um, and that might get a headline for a day or two, but all it would ensure is that the president would rally the Republicans in my district against me and I'd lose my next election. And I think they are collectively so terrified that this president in particular has a, a kind of power over their, their constituents and their base um, that they're unwilling to, uh, you know, by and large, almost exclusively, they're unwilling to risk that. Obviously, you know, Mitt Romney is an exception. There have been exceptions uh, here and there. Um, Justin Amash was a Republican who sort of left the party because of it. I mean, there, there are a handful of who have done it, but by and large, um, it is their, you know, political calculation that um, speaking out wouldn't do much, wouldn't damage the president, and would only damage their own political f fortunes. We have uh, Art Dodd, who has raised his hand. Art, if you want to go ahead and unmute and ask your question. So, Michael, taking back attack on a personal side, what about your own ongoing professional arc? Given your age, you've been out of school for 30 years. Myself, it's 40 years. And the pressure's on newspapers, even in the online world, to have revenue and subscribers. Do you see yourself becoming the columnist? Do you see yourself moving into editorship? Or what, what about your own personal arc for the next decade? Uh, thank you for that question. I mean, uh, I, I, I think being an editor could be one of the worst things ever. Um, um, I just it it feels like um, it feels like you 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 have to sit in a chair and not do the things that I've been loving doing, which is to get actually get out there and talk to people and and uh, and chase after the story. And um, so I I'm not inclined to do that. I, I guess I would never say never. Um, you know, if you'd asked me the question about the future of journalism uh, three or four five years ago, I would have been much more pessimistic. I feel like uh, if there's one thing that the Trump administration has done, it has sort of um, highlighted uh, a, a kind of need in the country for um, for reporting. And and I'm very old fashioned when it comes to uh, you know not being a fan of. Um, activism journalism or, uh, you know, the kind of journalism which takes a side. I feel like, you know, there are a handful of news organizations like the Times and, and the Wall Street Journal and, 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 um, uh, and the Washington Post, which are really, you know, taking, uh, making an effort to, to tell the truth. And, you know, the, the, the fact is that our, our, you know, those organizations who are doing that, um, are thriving. I mean, the New York Times has, has uh, you know, um, I think something like five or six million subscribers now, digital subscribers, um, even though ad revenue is continuing to plummet because of Google and because of everything else that's happened, uh, the Times has never done better. So I, I'm hopeful that, uh, you know, barring anything else that I would finish out my career. I, I don't know, honestly, whether I can take another four years of covering a president. I, this is, I'm going on 12 years now. And um, so whether it's Biden or Trump again, I'm not sure I could do another four years, but um, I'm not sure what I would do if I, if I didn't. I, I'm sort of interested in, I'm interested in the, the collision of uh, technology and policy uh, and you know, all of the issues that come about when you ask these questions about you know, privacy in the digital age and the, the struggles that the, the social media companies are going through uh, you know, having to do with uh, fact checking and the like. 
And that's, that's interesting to me. And I think that that's only going to get more complicated and that they're, that so, um, that's something that I might want to dive into in a, in a, in a deeper way. And that might take me off of the white house as a sort of, as a, a daily beat. Um, but I, I hope, I mean, I hope that there will still a decade from now and beyond that there will still be a real a hunger for, for regular daily journalism. Uh, classmate Chris Wilmiak um, asks Thanks, you, uh, given the ongoing protests, is there less of a focus on reporting on COVID? Do you as a White House correspondent have to follow the lead of the White House? So if the White House isn't focused on COVID, you as a reporter spend less time covering it. Uh, that's a great question. Hi, Chris. I don't know. I think I saw your name on here somewhere. Um, uh, hi. Hi. Uh, so yeah, I mean, look, I, it is, um, these last few days have been frustrating. Um, I think not because I don't think it's an important topic to cover uh, uh, the both the protests and the and the violence, but also the root causes of um, what caused the protests in the first place. I mean, that's the, you know, in some ways there isn't a a more important um, topic. Uh, and 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 if you look back, um, sort of pre impeachment, actually, the New York Times had had. Had had really decided that one of its focuses was going to be um, kind of racial racial um, kind of, kind of race in America and focusing on that. We got distracted by impeachment and we got then again distracted by COVID. So I, it's not like that topic isn't important. Um, but I do, as a as as a reporter who has been focused almost exclusively on covering um, on writing really sort of long in depth stories about the the administration's response to COVID and some of the failings of that response. Um, you know, I, I hope that we can all um, make sure we don't take the eye off that our eye off that ball because I really uh, th we are still in the middle of this and I have a story actually that will run in the uh, in the paper tomorrow that I've been working on for a month about the uh, CDC and the and the and the struggles of what you know is sort of considered around the world to be the the premier health public health organization in the in the world, um, but which had a lot of stumbles. Uh, both in terms of its decisions, its guidance that it gave to, to healthcare workers, the technology that it has that is uh, is uh, two decades old, which which made it hard for them to sort of accurately track um, infections. Um, at one point, somebody told us that um, they're still backing up most of their data or much of their data on recordable DVDs, which um, I think most of us have probably ditched long ago. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so I hope I hope that you know the viol I hope the violence subsides for the reasons that just I hope that it subsides and goes away, um, and that I hope we can you know do more than one thing at one time. But I do think we need to get back to uh, making sure that we hold the administration accountable to the to the response that we're still in the middle of. Richard Tibe asks uh, if you can speak on the importance and the impact of the dismissal of the five inspector generals. Um, you know, one of the things that happens in this administration is that we uh, we get so used to um, one amazing thing happening after another that it sometimes it you you sometimes have to stop and remind yourself how um, remarkable each individual thing is. And the truth is that the idea of a president of the United States um, summarily firing multiple uh, inspector generals, uh, inspectors general, um, uh, you know, for reasons that are not only plainly obvious, but are in fact stated in the actual firing when they, uh, when they, um, uh, when he's made them is, is just, is just unprecedented and remarkable. And, 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 you know, uh, if President Bush had fired one inspector general who was at the time investigating his administration, um, you know, that would have been a story that would have persisted for weeks. Um, you know, I, I, some people may be old enough to remember when he fired a bunch of U.S. attorneys uh, and replaced a bunch of U.S. attorneys, that's what President uh, Bush did. Um, that story went on for months. I mean, there were investigative journalists digging into sort of why did he uh, do that and, 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 you know, was there a political motive for it? Um, so, you know, and, and, and a lot, uh, often, one of the one of the remarkable things that's different about this administration than previous administrations is that it's it's just right in front of us. Um, 
the other day, and this goes back pre-COVID, I guess, uh, the president issued a bunch of pardons for just like uh, all sorts of rich rich guys, basically. Uh, there were some others as well, but a lot of them were his sort of rich buddies. And, um, you know, in another administration, uh, my editors would have been would have been on to me saying, you know, Mike, you have to figure out who was whispering in the president's ear to pardon all these people. Connect the dots between, you know, who are the big powerful money interests who were talking to the president, you know, to try to get him to pardon these people. But the thing about this, this president is that he issued the pardon statement and said in the statement, here are the people that I listened to, and he listed a bunch of like all of the sort of special interests who told him that he should pardon these people, which was remarkable. I mean, because it just sort of laid it out there. Like he's not, it, it's not, um, there's almost no shame in a sense uh, um, when it comes to him. And and so, so it's a little bit, it's a little bit different challenge. The challenge isn't to try to penetrate the bubble and get inside President Trump's head. He is there for us. It's really more of a fire hose problem where you're trying to drink from a fire hose and you can't, you can't sort of prioritize. So I, I, I think I think the inspectors general are important. I think, you know, we have a whole team of investigative reporters in the Washington Bureau and we continue to sort of, you know, press on issues like that, even as COVID happens, even as, you know, as these other things happen. And I, I think, you know, I, I think we're going to continue to look into that. Uh, David Heckendorf from Massachusetts asks, um, how does the president maintain a 40 plus percent approval rating and what's going to happen in November? <laughs> Small question. Happen? Yeah, what's going to happen in November? Um, you know, I don't know. Um, I, um, um, I think it would have been a difficult question to answer even before COVID. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I think you, you know you wouldn't want to underestimate the power of this president's political abilities. Um, he won the presidency the first time with uh, a really ragtag campaign operation that had had money, but it didn't. It was it was the most disorganized, um, uh, unsophisticated in a sense campaign operation that that I think any of us have ever seen. It was part of the reason probably that we all misunderstood what was happening in the country and didn't didn't really get what was gonna what was gonna happen um, but this time it is very different I mean this campaign that the president has assembled is as sophisticated and powerful and overwhelming as any I've ever seen um, they're going to have more money than God they are going to um, they are a highly professional data driven um, um, uh, well-staffed operation, campaign operation that will, um, uh, you know, that that will not suffer the same kind of confusion and and problems that the previous that that they did the last time. Um, that said, you know, the president also, you know, has more to answer for directly. I mean, you know, it's it's not like we didn't know who Donald Trump was in 2016, but to the extent that. Um, you know, th this is a president that has done an awful lot in the last three and a half years. And, you know, I think most of my colleagues, I, I'm not a full-time campaign reporter, but I think most of my colleagues who are, are convinced that this, this election is going to be more than any other that they can remember, a referendum on him rather than, rather than a, a kind of straight choice between him and Biden. And, you know, I guess the only real question is how does COVID scramble this? Like how much campaign, what, none of us have ever seen a campaign like this. None of us have ever seen a campaign where you don't, where people aren't out on the trail all the time. I mean, I, I spent in 2007 and 2008, I was like on the road, like 370 days or something. And it was crazy between those two years. I just never came home. And, and then, and so this is so different than anything anybody has seen. And I, I don't know. I, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of people out there, especially on the left who think, that um, he's toast and that like, you know, this country's never going to um, reelect him given, you know, and then the litany of things from, you know, separating kids at the border to impeachment being, 
you know, the third president impeached in history. I mean, you know, all of it. They, I mean, I think there's some people on the left that have convinced themselves that there's no way he can win. Um, I don't think that's true. I think he can win. I don't know that he will win, um, but I think that he can win. And, and I think that the, the COVID thing has scrambled it so much that I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure anybody knows really what's going to happen. Thank you. Um, we have uh, a question from uh, Laura Grislano in Phoenix. Uh, do you believe that Twitter is undermining our democracy? Or alternatively, making it possible for a broader education of the public regarding executive action? Hmm. Um, I hate Twitter, um, mostly because it's ruined my life and sleep. Um, we literally had to reorganize our entire White House staffing plan um, around Trump's tweets. We used to have one person of the five or six of us, one person on duty every week, and we would sort of switch off. Um, but even before, even just in the weeks in, uh, during the transition before the president started, like it became clear that that was impossible because you would wake up at 5.30 in the morning to a tweet that you would immediately have to write about. And he would keep tweeting until midnight or 12.30 in the morning. And you'd have to keep writing about, I mean, it was just one person couldn't do it. Um, so we now have two people on duty um, covering the White House every every day. And then we sort of rotate rotate that. Um, and that's largely driven by, by, by Twitter. And I think... Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot to be said for Twitter and that, and, and I think you can make the case that it's a democratizing force that allows people to, you know, that, that, that allows people to have a voice and a broader voice and a broader reach than, um, you know, than they would have had without social media. Uh, but I do think that it's, um, you know, it can be an awful, awful place. I mean, the, my, my colleague Maggie Haberman, um, who, uh, is a fantastic reporter and a fantastic person is routinely barraged and abused by uh, people on Twitter on the left and the right. Um, I get it sometimes not as bad as she does. Um, and I think it can be a pretty ugly, horrible place to be. Um, uh, you know, I don't think it's going anywhere. And so I think we just sort of have to figure out how to, you know, you know, we've struggled for a lot, a lot of time at the New York Times about you know, what are the tweets that we can ignore? Um, we should ignore them. We should not be, you know, we shouldn't be distracted. You know, there's this sort of golden object theory of President Trump's communications where he just, the minute he doesn't want to talk about thing A, he sort of tweets out something that you sort of then all run to the ball. Um, and we shouldn't allow ourselves to be distracted. That, that said, you know, um, the, the president has used Twitter as the official announce, you know, place that he makes public policy announcements. And, you know, if the President of the United States says something, you can't, uh, you can't always ignore it. Um, and you have to deal with it. So um, I, I think it's difficult, but I think, uh, uh, and so I think it's got some good points, but I think it's really, a, it's problematic as well. John McDowell up in the Bay Area asks, how do you get the quote unquote on background comments? John hears there's sometimes Trump himself. Is that true? Also, he hears there's code for the way people on background are described. Do you care to detail? Um, uh, some, Trump, Trump sometimes talks to us on background. Um, uh, you know, the New York Times has taken the position that the President of the United States should never, ever be quoted on background. Um, and, and so we uh, generally avoid, you know, if we do an interview with the President, it's got to be on the record. Um, some of the exceptions to that tend to come when we're part of a group. So for example, when, when we're traveling on Air Force One and um, you're in the back of the plane and the president comes, uh, you know, comes back and talks to the reporters who are assembled, there's usually 13 reporters in the plane. Um, and if the, if the group decides, yeah, we're gonna talk to him on background, there's nowhere for the New York Times reporter to go. So we, we do that, we listen to the president. Um, you know, it's my view, especially that like, you know, barring those kinds of situations that we shouldn't allow, you know, if the President of the United States wants to talk to the New York Times, he should do that on the record. Um, we do, however, talk to a lot of his people on background in the same way that we talked to a lot of Obama people and Bush people and Clinton people. Um, it is the way 
unfortunately things are done in Washington and we could all wish that everybody would just put their name to everything that they say. It's not the way it works in Washington. Nobody wants to, um, you know, if you, if you insisted on that as a policy, you would just never talk to anybody, I think. Um, but what we do try to do is we try to be a little bit transparent by, by always, um, if we're quoting somebody or, or, or having somebody tell us information on background, we try to give uh, the readers the explanation for why they're on background. Maybe they're on background because they're not authorized to talk about that particular meeting. Maybe they're on background because uh, you know, the decision that they're talking about hasn't been actually formally made yet. We try to be somewhat um, transparent as much as we can, both about who they are in terms of what kind of official, which agency do they work for, that can give the reader some, you know, clue as to what their motivations might be. Um, and, you know, there aren't, I, I think the question was, are there sort of like tricky ways that we signal who this person really is? Um, I, you know, I, I try not to get into those games because, because that can really backfire on you. You know, part of part of journalism is building trust with your sources. And if you want people to tell you, uh, to, to keep talking to you and to keep telling you what's going on in the government, uh, they need to believe that you're not gonna out them or, or, uh, or, or misquote them or use their information wrongly. So, you know, I try to stick to, I think the usual uh, term is senior administration official that usually covers this sort of general group of people that I'm talking to at, at any given moment. Um, and, and that's, that's sort of how I do it. What is your relationship with the White House, the, the White House itself, the press office, chief of staff, the president himself? Is there, um, is it friendly? Is it combative? Uh, um, so I always like to give people a little bit of context. You know, um, the relationship with any White House is always, and, and reporters who cover them is always somewhat tense and strained. Um, you know, I covered the Obama administration for eight years. There were plenty of screaming fights that I had with, you know, Obama aides. Um, there was one fella in particular named Dan Pfeiffer, who was the communications director uh, for, for President Obama for a while and then became a senior advisor. And um, my wife can attest to the fact that um, at, you know, many mornings at 530 in the morning, I would open my email and there would be an obscenity laced email from Dan Pfeiffer about some story that I'd written. Um, I, I named Dan because he and I've had this conversation many times before. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not as if, um, this is the first president, Trump is the first presidency who, um, you know, who, where reporters have a sort of tense relationship. Um, I think though that there's a fundamental and really horrible difference. And that is that in, in every other presidency, you know, the, 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 the clashes that you would have with the White House are kind of over individual stories or an individual fact in a story or a dispute that they might have about a particular thing that you wrote that they take issue with. Um, what we've never had before is the kind of um, from the top, um, um, you know, overwhelming uh, antagonism, attacks, uh, enemy of the people, fake news, um, and, and that filters down. And, and as you can imagine, I mean, we, myself and my colleagues have tried for three and a half years to build relationships like we always do in these cases, um, build relationships with the senior aides, with the National Security Council officials, with the people in the press office, um, with the uh, senior advisors, with the council's office. I mean, they, you know, this is not, um, you know, this is what we always do, right? I mean, this is the, 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 the way covering the White House works is that you build this relationship. Um, you know, both sides have a job to do and they're not necessarily the same, but you, you try to have a kind of cordial relationship. Um, and that has been really tough in this administration. That's not to say that I haven't had some uh, successes. There have been, although frankly, there's been so much turnover that, you know, you sort of you find a person that is, um, uh, you know, that's sort of able, you're able to work with and then, and then that person leaves. Um, 
and I think it's fair to say that it's been really, it's been really a challenge. Um, you know, they're not, you know, they're taking their cues, most of them from the president and his, um, and his political attacks on the press. And so I think that that has been really tough. I think the, the bigger problem, though, frankly, is not just kind of making it tough for people like me, but is, you know, the, the um, demonization of the press, uh, the demonization of media, and, and the, you know, I mean, it has real world effects and we're seeing it actually, I think, uh, playing out in these riots over the last several days where, you know, uh, the police have been much more aggressive towards reporters and journalists that have been covering these, um, the violence than I've ever seen before. And, you know, you have to wonder whether some of that, um, you know, some of that responsibility lies with the president who has just, you know, relentlessly uh, attacked the press as, as somehow, you know, uh, less than less than human, um, so I think it's been it's been a real challenge. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I do recognize we have hit the one hour mark. Uh, some of you may need to sign off. Uh, Mike has agreed to stay on for a little bit longer to answer more questions. I know there are a lot of questions still yet to be answered, but if you do have to sign off, uh, a big thank you from uh, the Alumni and Parent Engagement Office, the Advancement Office, and the entire college for taking an hour and uh, engaging with us. Um, if you haven't yet made your uh, year-end gift, our fiscal year is June 30, please consider a uh, donation to support the college or the Crisis Response Fund at cnc.edu slash donate. Um, next up, we have um, actually a recent alumna uh, who asks about Trump's immigration policies and what you think uh, they will do to H-1B visas for international students at places like CMC or also the, uh, the OPT and the STEM OPT, which for, I don't know the exact um, uh, acronym there, but it's the, the, the work permissions after international students graduate. Um, so I'll, I'll be quick because I know we only have a few more minutes. Uh, I think those are definitely... Um, um, on the chopping block, at least there, um, my my latest reporting suggests that um, there are there is an executive order that's being prepared that would uh, at least temporarily cut back, if not eliminate, both the H one B visas, the high tech visas, um, um, as well as the OPT. Um, the the fight inside the administration right now is um, over whether or not those those uh, changes would be permanent or whether they would uh, um, whether they would just be temporary sort of COVID related measures. Um, and, and look, you know, obviously anything that were to happen would probably uh, would probably be reversed if Biden wins. But, um, but I think there, I think there is um, plenty of reason to think that at least in the short run, uh, some of those programs may, might well be affected. Thank you. Alec Lapata uh, uh, from Chicago asks, it feels like every week nowadays there's a new defining issue that we think in the moment will decide the election, but then it's overtaken by the next week. Um, what of all the issues we've seen from COVID to Black Lives Matter to Russian interference to healthcare um, will be the one that truly defines the election in the way that you saw immigration defining 2016? I, I, that's a great question. I mean, honestly, um, I would have thought at the end of impeachment, and, and frankly, I have friends that are writing impeachment related books uh, because everybody thought that that was going to be the sort of defining topic uh, that, that uh, people that, that people were going to, that the election in 2020 was going to be essentially a referendum on whether people believed that he should have been impeached or not. Um, I'm sort of convinced now that like, I don't even know if people are going to remember that he was impeached, frankly, at this point. Um, um, you know, it's, I think it's, I think the easiest answer is probably that, that, uh, you know, COVID is going to overwhelm everything. I mean, it, it, it sort of depends where we are. If, um, you know, if there's a second wave of the, of the virus and it hits right as, as the, as the country goes to the, the polls, I think that becomes the dominant issue. I think that what happens with the economy, you know, we've got 40 million people unemployed. Uh, does that improve? Uh, you know, is that on the upswing? You know, by the time people go to vote, is or, or, you know, and even if it is, is it enough to you know to convince people, you know, to go a different direction? Um, it's it's hard to imagine that isn't the, the sort of dominant issue. Um, but as as you say, like, I mean, who knows what's around the corner? I mean, I don't think any of us kind of have a real sense of um, 
you know, what else could pop up? Uh, Jeff Baum from Pasadena asks um, two questions. The first is, are there any signs of Russian interference, especially during unrest, like in 2016? Also, will there be a sequel to the fourth estate? Uh, hey, Jeff. Um, I don't, you know, I, the, the um, oh, there, there you are. Um, the, um, you know, the, the various Intel community folks who watch Russian interference have said repeatedly that they see signs of um, ongoing Russian activity uh, aimed at, at influencing the election. Uh, absolutely. They, you know, it's, um, uh, you know, on social media, it's on, um, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of activism that is, you know, or, or, or it's, it's, fake, it's bots and, and fake, fake accounts that are dressed up as activism. Um, you know, I think, I think just as we didn't know, you know, it was hard to tell to connect the dots between how much did all of that activity in the 2016 campaign, how, how much did that influence the actual vote? I think we don't know. And, and we don't know how much more aggressive or more sophisticated, I mean, you have to assume it's four years later, you got to, four five years later, you got to assume the Russians and whoever else have gotten even more sophisticated than they were back, back then. Um, so, you know, I, and I think that if you, if you were to talk to the Intel community Honestly, they are frustrated that, you know, it's something that they would like to engage more deeply against. Um, but you have a president who, for all sorts of reasons, has no interest in making that a big issue and highlighting, um, you know, that, that as a potential threat. Um, so I, I, you know, I think you've got, you've got this weird thing where on the surface, no, you know, the president and the administration don't want to talk about it underneath the surface you know, the kind of, the kind of Intel bureaucracy is, is kind of afraid of what's happening. And I think we just don't know. Um, and what was the other part of the question? Uh, the oh, fourth, the fourth, fourth, fourth estate. estate. Um, so the fourth estate, for those who don't know, was a, was a four part documentary that aired on Showtime that, um, where basically filmmakers were in our Washington Bureau office for uh, almost a year. Uh, during the first year of the administration and filmed every waking minute. My God, it was awful. Um, and, uh, and they produced a really remarkable uh, documentary. I mean, I think it's got to be boring to most people who are watching it, but for me, it was really cool. Um, and uh, my mom thought it was really cool. And, um, but uh, I know the filmmakers, I love them to death. Uh, I think if you ask them, they, you know, at one point they said, oh, we'll definitely do part two, but it took a lot out of them. And I suspect that um, they're, yeah, we'll see if, if Trump were to get reelected, I could see them deciding that, um, that they, they wanted to do something again or to do a part two. Uh, it, it premiered at Tribeca and it got lots of like kudos and whatever. So I, I'd, I'd be game for it. It was, it was an invasive kind of weird thing to be constantly typing with a camera sort of watching over you, but um, uh, we'll see. A question from Donald Klein. Um, do you believe that Trump's uh, desire for blind loyalty uh, is more than just against deep state bureaucrats? Uh, he references the, the departures of so many of his actual appointees whom he perceived as disloyal. So blind, that, that deep state is very much against him, but in so many ways, the loyalty requirement of the people who are close to him when they're leaving isn't one and the same. Yeah, no, I think that's right. That's an important distinction. Um, and and he he really has uh, cycled through more of that sort of political, uh, top political uh, leadership than I think any president in recent history anyway. Um, you know, I, I, think the, I think the best example or one of the best examples that I know of that whole dynamic was, uh, was Kirsten Nielsen, who I mentioned before, who was the DHS secretary. I mean, this was a person who he nominated. He, it was, she was deputy, deputy uh, chief of staff. And then he, um, you know, hand selected her to, to become DHS secretary to, to replace Kelly. And, you know, uh, um, she was she was fiercely loyal to him. She was fiercely loyal. She was the one um, who signed the memorandum secretly that put in place the the separation of children at the borders. Um, she was uh, you know she was kind of the the head of the kind of the political 
um, uh, I mean, Stephen Miller was was really the architect of it, but she was the sort of uh, head of the political apparatus and the bureaucracy that put put forth the building of the wall and all of the other key sort of immigration policies. And yet she was also the person who, more than anybody that we found, um, um, you know, fought with the president and pushed back against the president and 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 said no to the president. I mean, over and over again, we documented in the book. Um, you know, there was a moment right before the 2018 campaign where the president had publicly said, seemed to suggest that the military should go ahead and shoot migrants as they can't come over the border. He said, you know, if the migrants are throwing rocks, we should use rifles. And you know. Nielsen's staff went nuts and like had, you know, went and, you know, found the, the, the use of force policy that is in place and like took it to the, pre got Jared Kushner to take it to the president and put it in front of his desk and say, Mr. President, you cannot shoot to kill migrants as they're coming across the border. And he finally relents and he's in a meeting with Kirsten Nielsen and he says, uh, he says, okay, okay, I get it. We can't, we can't shoot to kill. And then he, he looks at her and he says, but but we can shoot them in the legs to slow them down, right? <laughs> to which she sort of looks at him and says, no, Mr. President, you can't do that either. And, but you know, it's this sort of really weird duality where on the one hand, she's desperate for his approval. You know, she's desperate to kind of be the one, she has a huge co um, competition with Jeff Sessions at the time, who was attorney general over who was gonna get credit um, for a lot of the tough immigration policies because she wanted to get credit for a lot of them, but Jeff Sessions wanted to get credit. So it, on the one hand, she's trying to be this fiercely loyal person who wants to get credit for all this stuff. On the other hand, she's fighting every time he comes with something that's some cockamamie idea, she's fighting with him. And ultimately that's why she gets fired, right? He fires her because they, they go to the border and he says, I wanna shut the whole border down. I'm just so frustrated, I wanna shut it down, tell people that they can't come in. And she says, Mr. President, you can't do that. You just can't shut the border down. Um, and, uh, and of course, then he fires her and, and for, for, for essentially you know, saying no to him. And so I, I do think that um, you know, you know, that the tension between all of the, and, and so what has happened is this purge over the last year, six months to a year, is a purge of all the people like Nielsen, right? Um, James Mattis is gone, Nielsen is gone, Kelly is gone. Um, you know, and so what's left is uh, are people who um, are, you know, tend to be more willing to be to play the loyal soldier and less willing to be the person that says no to him. And in fact, I think last night, I think we're going to find that last night, um, you know, when when he it was President Trump's idea to march out, you know, sort of clear the protesters out and march to the church. I think we're going to find that there was nobody in the room uh, who said to the president, you know, that's not maybe a great idea uh, to do that. And, and that's where, you know, the loyalty, uh, kind of the, the demand for complete loyalty, I think, kind of breaks down because I'm not sure that he was helped by that in the end. On that note, Mike, uh, a big thank you from the college and from our alumni and parents for taking an hour and a quarter out of your day to day. Uh, I am gonna unmute everybody and you can say thank you or, or hello or, or do that wave uh, to Mike and you can see uh, a lot of the faces that have been uh, on for the last hour and a quarter. So here we go, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful night. Be safe. Thank Thanks you, for your support thank of the you college. Everybody. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you, thank you so much. It was